We're here at uh, Biggin Hill in Ohakia, uh, RNZF Base Ohakia, but your facility here. Um, standing in front of Spitfire PV270. So how long have you been in the facility here now? Uh, well this, this particular hangar we've been in for I think just on nine years. Right. Uh, we, it was finished about a year after the Spitfire first flew Three. and our second hangar is just in the process. We're just about nearly finished. Yeah, right. We're so close now yeah. we'll be able to start using it soon. So from memory the Spitfire first flew was it 2009? Uh, March the 18th 2009. 2009. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So can you give us a little bit of history of, of this particular aircraft? Where did you pick it up? How long did it take you to, to restore it? Well the, this particular aircraft was built in 1944 at Castle Bromwich and then served with the Royal Air Force uh, in northern Italy in the last six months of the Second World War. Okay. It was like so many aircraft after the war it was parked up and left and in 1947 they donated it to the Italian Air Force. Right. Uh, they used it and then they sold it to the Israeli Air Force. They used it for a couple of years and then they sold it to the Burmese Air Force. Right. And what makes it a little bit unusual is that it then went back into combat uh, because the Burmese were fighting a border war with the nationalist Chinese that had uh, popped over the border when Mao Zedong took over. Right, right. So it went back in battle a second time. And also it was one of the last operational Spitfires in the world because it had its last flight in Burma right. in January 1956. Right, right. So it's got quite an operational history to it. Yeah, a very interesting operational history. Four Air Forces, two wars. And mm. after the Burmese had finished with it, they put it up on a pole, uh, sadly, for about 26 years. <laughs> and it slowly deteriorated Terrated. up there. Yeah. And then an American collector um, purchased the three ones that were gate guardians okay. and sold two of them to UK customers right. and kept this one uh, to rebuild uh, but I went and saw him a couple of years later and um, managed to persuade him to sell it to me and we brought it back to New Zealand. So where, where was it at that stage? Was it, it was in Missouri. Oh, so yeah. it had actually gone as far as the, the US yes, it and, left, and you it, bought it from it, there. Right. Three of them had left um, Burma yeah. and two of them had gone straight away to the UK. One of those two is flying again, right. uh, the other one's still not flying uh, okay. and this one was he kept to restore it right. himself but he had other things on his plate so in the end uh, he decided to let happen. go of it and we shipped it back to New Zealand and began a restoration, restoration. of it. Right. So when, when did, was that? When did it arrive here in New it Zealand? It arrived here in uh, 2001 okay. and we kept it in storage while we planned out uh, the what we would do about it, how yep. we would restore it, uh, yep. whether we'd send it to Auckland or whether we'd do it as we ended up doing, do it ourselves. Yep. Um, and we started that process at the beginning of 2004 okay. and it took us uh, five years and three months to get it fully airworthy again. Right. So that was a, a, a full on five day a week operation? Yes. It, was, it wasn't a part time it a, thing, was no, it? No, it was a full time. Oh, we had a full time yeah. crew of six people oh, okay. working on it. Yep. Uh, anything up to nine or ten at different times, times depending yeah. on the uh, specialised parts of it. Right. And then of course that process added up to about 35,000 man hours That's to get right. the thing done. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good to get it done nice and nice and quickly. Yeah, well, I think one of the things that allowed us to do also is to do it the way we want, I wanted it done, which was absolutely original. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, we were able to reuse about probably 70% of the aeroplane, oh, okay. uh, which is unusual. All of the fuselage frames, all of the wing ribs. Um, right. Being a stress skin aircraft, you've got to uh, replace yeah. the skins anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we've reused as much as we could, right. and we've taken it back to a state that it would have been in 1943, yeah. 1944, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. So, for those people that don't know, um, the the coding on the aircraft AL. Give me a little bit of history about that. What and and why were you keen on on the Spitfire to start with? Well, I've, I mean, I've had a lifelong interest since I was six years old when I first met my uncle, uh, El Dia, right. um, when he came back to Whanganui. Right. And uh, he, he sparked an interest in me, and that's never gone away. Right. Yeah. And he was a Spitfire pilot from Dunkirk to D-Day. Um, yeah. He flew nothing but Spitfires. Well, he operationally flew Spitfires that whole time. Right. Um, and the Mark 9, which we have here, was his favourite Spitfire. He thought it was the best of the Spitfires. It right. was powerful enough, but still had all the characteristics of the earlier ones, uh, unlike the later ones, which I think became so powerful that they were almost a different aeroplane. Right. Right. Uh, so he, he particularly uh, liked the Spitfire. He, he had, it was how his career was defined. Right. Yeah. And when he became a wing leader in 1943, one of the things that a wing leader could do was have their initials on the plane. Right. 
Uh, most people did put their initials mm -hmm. on. Johnny Checkets had John Milne Checkets, JMC, mm -hmm. yep. but L was always known as L Deer, yeah, so he put L on his plate. Right. Okay. So here in the facility, you've got the Harvard, obviously you've got the Spitfire, you've also got the Avenger, which isn't here today. Um, I guess a few people in New Zealand were, were surprised that they could understand the, the Spitfire and, and Audi. What, how did you end up having the, the Avenger as well? Because that had been in New Zealand previously, hadn't it? Yeah, the, the, our particular one, Plonky, was originally with Sir Tim Wallace. He yeah. bought it out from the UK and was here for about, I think, 10 or 11 years yeah. before it went to Australia. So I, I, it's funny thing, is one of those things with aeroplanes, you know, you never quite know what, what interests <laughs> you. And I've always found the Grumman Avenger particularly interesting. Ever since I first saw one, in the playground at Havelock North right, uh, and right. climbed through it, or what was left of it <laughs> then, yeah. I've always had an interest. And I think it's it's, it's, a, it's a key part of the RNZF history because yeah. they operated 48 of them up in the Pacific. Yeah. They were involved in um, you know significant combat um, sorties right, and so yeah. on, yeah. around Rabaul and so on. Yeah. And our particular one, the Plonky um, markings on it, signify a crew of three that were lost over Rabaul in oh, okay. 1944. Right. And of course, post-war in New Zealand, they were important for, for that top dressing, that started that whole top dressing thing, went yeah. to trials and, and so on. So yeah, after the war they kept four of them, yeah. um, so the rest of them were, were returned or and I think a lot of them were dumped off the, off the carriers off the coast of Brisbane, so right. the, yep. into the sea there, but um, <laughs> the four that were kept were used as target tugs, but one of them of course in 1948 was used for the first top dressing yeah. trials here at Ahakea. Yeah. Right. So right. one day we must organise to drop some superphosphate on this one. <laughs> yeah, that, that would certainly be a, a sight to see because that, contrary to what a lot of people think of the aircraft, they are actually quite big inside, aren't they? Yes, it's got a it's got a, a bomb load of two thousand pounds, yes, which yes. is which is effectively a ton. And, and if you think about it, a B seventeen Flying Fortress on on the way to Berlin could only carry twice that. Yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah. it was quite a significant load. And it explains why they were so popular after the war, war. for spraying, um, yeah. crop spraying or for forest spraying. Um, it's a big aeroplane, it weighs yeah. six tonnes, yeah. sitting there doing nothing. nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, the facility here at Biggin Hill, it's actually on RNZF base um, Ohakia here mm. in New Zealand. Um, but you have a Facebook page, don't you? And, yep. and you're working towards perhaps having some uh, open days further down the track. So if people are interested in what you've got here and what you're doing, they can look at the Facebook page and, yep. and hopefully we have We have a them. website and a Facebook page, but yep. the Facebook one is the one that's most updated because I try and put something on there every week. And yep. we've got about three and a half thousand people from around the world right. that follow it pretty uh, regularly. Yep. So uh, that's how we try and keep people informed. We try and let people know when the aircraft are flying yep. as best as we can. But, you yep. know, the weather is such a a fickle master uh, <laughs> that you're never quite sure no. with what, the, what you plan is going to happen, happen yeah. or Sometimes what happens is what you haven't planned <laughs> to some extent. Yeah. Absolutely. But yep, so the Facebook page and the website will yeah. keep everybody up to date. Yeah, so. well, I hope so, yeah. yeah. And we, we encourage people to contribute to it, you know, relevant yeah. stuff. We're yeah. not too interested in the, the general sort of aviation yeah. stuff because there's plenty of That's pages plenty of for other that. Sites. So, yeah. 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 so if it's yeah. relevant to what we're doing yeah. or what we're trying to do here, we're always keen to see the contributions. That's right. Excellent. Oh, uh, Brendan, thanks very much. You're most welcome, Alan. Thank <laughs> you.